announcements uh, this evening. So if you guys are in Numbers chapter 21, we will pray and then we will talk about it. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, that you are... Um, Lord, I'm reminded of a chorus of a song, Lord, that you are the, the way maker, Lord, the miracle worker, the promise keeper, the light in the darkness. God, that is who you are. And Lord, we just had a beautiful testimony of that tonight, God, how, um, Lord, your people, um, Lord, your people who are not Americans, Lord, who are uh, in poverty, um, Lord, who live such a different lifestyle than us, but Lord, they're your people. And God, they were sick. And God, we saw that you healed them. And Lord, that's so exciting to see. Um, Lord, that you are at work uh, globally. And um, Lord, you care about salmon. Lord, you care about Idaho. Lord, you care about Kenya. As we're going to see tonight, Jesus, you, you care about the whole world. That's why you died for the whole world. And uh, what an encouragement it is just to see that, God. So we just want to give you the praise and the glory for, the, uh, for your hand, Lord, this week in that miracle. Oh, what a beautiful thing that is to see. And thank you for the opportunity, Lord, that we have um, as a relatively, Lord, small drop in the bucket to participate in that. Lord that, Lord, that we just have a little bit to do with the work that's going on, Lord, there in Kenya. That's such a blessing, God, and we thank you for that opportunity uh, to uh, minister to those people. Um, God, tonight as we look at Numbers chapter 21, we just ask that you would speak to us um, Lord, such an important chapter uh, in the Old Testament. I dare would say one of the most important chapters in the Old Testament because of the context and the foundation on which it lays. So God, tonight as we look at this, I just pray that you would speak to us. God, that your spirit would be here ministering to us. Um, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Man. My uh, teeth are a little sore because I went to the dentist earlier today and they cleaned them. And guess who has two cavities? The kid that ate a whole bunch of candy in the past month, right? That's hard to believe. So I got to get those fixed in December, but my, my teeth are a little sore right now. So we're in Numbers chapter 21 tonight, though, and uh, it tells us here in verse number one, it says, the king of Arad, the Canaanite, who dwelt in the south, heard that Israel was coming on the road to Atharim. Then uh, he fought against Israel and took of them prisoners. So the children of Israel at this point, if you remember, they're at the tail end of their wilderness wandering experience. Um, Last week, we kind of crossed the threshold between Numbers chapter 19 and Numbers chapter 21. You have a time span of 37 years that happened. So we're right there at the end of the 38 or the 40 year period time that they're getting close to entering into the promised land. They've been wandering in the wilderness for 37 and a half years about at this point. A whole lot of nothing has went on. They've been disobeying God. They've been complaining. And God picks up the narrative last week with chapter 20 and deals with um, some stuff there. But as we're here in chapter 21, just keep in mind that they're they're so close. God's dealing with another generation. It's not the same generation that he led out of Egypt. It's now their kids, and he's got them close. But we're going to see, just because they're close to the promised land, doesn't mean things are going to be easy for them. Tonight, starting in verse number one, we see that they encounter a group of people known as the Canaanites. And the Canaanites are going to be a famous enemy of Israel. As we study throughout the Old Testament, we're going to see this group of people come up over and over and over again. <clears throat> now, this is history. This is true. This stuff actually happened. But when you read this type of stuff, it's not an error to realize that the, the Canaanites represent, they picture the flesh and sin. And that's why we're going to read about God wanting to utterly destroy them because they represent the bad guys, the yuckiness in the world. And um, he wants his people to completely destroy that stuff from their lives. But here's Israel. They encounter the Canaanites. And this is not the first time, even in the book of Numbers, that we've seen Israel come up against the Canaanites. Back in Numbers chapter 14, verse number 45, we see that they encounter the Canaanites. This is about 30 seven years earlier, and this is what happened then. It says, Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in the mountains came down and attacked them, being Israel, and drove them, Israel, back as far as Hormah. 
So Israel, 37 years previously, had an encounter with the Canaanites, and the Canaanites completely whooped them and drove them in the opposite direction. Here they are 37 years later, and they're encountering the same group of people, yet we're going to see the outcome is much different. As it goes on to say in verse number two, so Israel made a vow to the Lord. It said, if you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. This time, before Israel goes into battling their enemies, they go before God and they say, God, we've realized something over these 37 years. And what we've realized is that we need you. Uh, in order for us to be successful in anything that we do, Lord, we need to bring it before you first and allow you to help us. Jesus taught in John chapter 15, verse number 5. He said, without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do no thing. And that's what the children of Israel learned. Even in battle, when they're fighting against the Canaanites, 37 years earlier, God wasn't with them in the way that he is now, and they tuck their tails and run. But now that they've done it the right way, now that they've brought it before God, now that they're walking in God's will and God is with them, we're going to see that uh, the children of Israel are going to whip the Canaanites. Verse number um, 3 says, And the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities, so the name of that place was called Horma. God, I like how verse 3 starts, and the Lord listened. Here's Israel. The ones who, uh, the golden calf, the ones who complained about the manna, the ones who complained about water, the ones who complained about Moses, the ones who complained about Aaron. Here's Israel praying to God, and verse number 3 doesn't start out with, and God rolls his eyes at his people. No, his people pray to him, and it says, and the Lord listened. This brings me so much comfort, guys, in my own life. It's like even when I screw up, even when I'm not faithful, even when I disobey God, when the time comes when I'm ready to do things right and I go before God, he is there ready to listen. It says, and the Lord listened to the voice of Israel, and he delivered up the Canaanites, and they, Israel, utterly destroyed them and their cities, so that the name of that place was called Horma. Now, Horma literally means utter destruction. So they call that place Horma because that is the place where they utterly destroyed the Canaanites. Now, let's spiritualize this a little bit and think about how it applies to our life. If the Canaanites is kind of a picture or a type of sin, and here we see God allowing his people to kind of utterly destroy the flesh, we could say, in their lives, and he calls the name of this place Horma, it causes me to ask the question, what things in our life can we label as horma? What things in our life can we say, God has allowed me to utterly destroy that? Uh, There's there certain things that maybe we used to struggle with in times past when we truly give that thing over to God and he gives us <laughs> victory in it. We're able to say that thing has now been utterly destroyed in my life. Verse four goes on to say, then they journeyed from Mount Hor which is where Aaron was buried, remember, by the way of the Red Sea, to go around the land of Edom. Why do they have to go around the land of Edom? Remember last week in chapter 20, verse 21, they approach their long lost relatives, the Edomites, their cousins, and they go, you're familiar with our story. You know we were enslaved in Egypt for 400 years and God's had us on this journey. And we're so close to where God wants to take us. Could we just pass through your property? And the Edomites go, no way. So they have to go around the land of Edom. They go around Edom. And uh, the soul of the people become very discouraged on the way. Mm, they're so, so close. First of all, realize they've just had a huge victory. <clears throat> and being... Uh, and given the power to defeat the Canaanites. They've had a huge victory in their life, and yet now they are even closer to the promised land than ever before, and the result is that they're actually discouraged. They're discouraged on the way. And this can happen for us so often. Usually after we have a great victory in our lives, the next emotion that follows after the high is discouragement. Uh, <laughs> because that's kind of how... And when Satan wants to try to come in and get us to be discouraged. It happened with Jesus there in um, the Gospel of Matthew. 
after Jesus has this great um, experience with um, his father, he gets drove, after he gets baptized, after the spirit comes down upon him, after he's a voice from heaven, after that he gets drove into the wilderness for 40 days and he's tempted. You just see this like very high spiritual experience and then a low one. And that's what's happening for the children of Israel here. They have a great victory and now all of a sudden as they're still on the way, they find themselves discouraged. And we need to realize that in our lives, in our walk with the Lord, that's going to happen. And we cannot really allow that to take us by surprise because Peter told us in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 12, he says this. He says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. He goes, don't be surprised when fiery trials happen to you because that's not strange. He's saying that would be normal. Peter almost makes the argument that like, you should almost be expecting that life isn't going to go well. So as the children of Israel get discouraged, God doesn't like that. Why? Because for them... The same thing is true for us. When we allow ourselves to get discouraged, whether we like it or not, what we're essentially saying to the Lord is, God, I feel like you've dropped the ball on this situation. God, I feel like you've let me down, and because of that, I am experienced this discouragement. You see, the opposite of discouragement is encouragement. God wants us to be encouraged instead of being discouraged. God wants us to encourage each other instead of discouraging each other. And here we see they're experiencing this time of discouragement on the way. So what does God do in verse number five? Great parenting strategy that the Lord uses. It says, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water and our soul loathes this worthless bread. As they're discouraged, they start to complain. As they complain, who do they complain about? They complain against God, and they complain against Moses. They complain against God. They complain against God's prophet, and they complain against God's provision, the bread. They say there's no food here, which isn't true. There is bread. There is manna. They say there's no food. They say there's no water. Is that true? What just happened two chapters ago? Remember the rock that Moses struck, even though he did it in a misrepresentative way, water still flowed forth. So there is food, there is water. The problem is, is they're just not happy with the provision that God has given them. So they say at the end of verse number five, our souls loathed this worthless bread, this manna from heaven, God, your provision that you've given us in our eyes at this stage of the game, Lord, we find it as worthless in our sight. God doesn't like it when we call his provision worthless, as we're going to see here in the next verse. They're not satisfied with God has provided for them. They're dissatisfied with the bread from heaven. They're dissatisfied with the bread from heaven. In John chapter 6, Jesus said, I am the bread that's come down from heaven. In Deuteronomy and in John, Jesus says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Throughout the Bible, the word of God is described as bread. Jesus is described as bread, the manna that comes down from heaven. The people back in Israel's time are dissatisfied with the manna, the literal bread from heaven, the angel's food that God has provided. And so too today, there's many Christians in this world that are dissatisfied with the word of God. They go, man, this, our, 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 our soul, it, it loathes this worthless. This is an old book. It's worthless to us. It's like, no, 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 no. Do not turn against God's provision. Verse number six, what does God do? It says, so the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. You want to be discouraged? <laughs> God says, I'll give you something to discourage you in this moment. I'm going to send some fiery serpents that are going to bite you. Now, what is this? I I like it. It's not just serpents. It's fiery serpents. Now, this implies a few things. One, it could be describing the color. Maybe they're a red or an orange. But two, I'm suggesting it probably implies the feeling you get after they bite you, right? Fiery venom shooting through your blood vessels as these serpents bite the people. And the result of being bit by these serpents is that many of the people of Israel died. Verse 7, Therefore... The people came to Moses, and they said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord 
and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Man, they've been discouraging. They've been complaining. Serpents come, bite them. They realize how messed up they are. They go back to Moses, the one they were just complaining about, and they say, ah, we've sinned. We've messed up. Uh, Would you please pray on behalf of us and get the Lord to get rid of these serpents? Two things we see here in verse number seven. First, they say, we have sinned. This would be confession. They realize that they have sinned. They realize that they've done something wrong. The first step in order for them to be healed is they need to realize that they need healing. In order to get salvation, you need to realize that you need salvation. So they realize their current state, and that state is that they've sinned and that they have a poison flowing through their blood. And after that, they turn to Moses and they say, can you pray to the Lord for us? They've confessed, and now they turn to Moses and they ask him to intercess for them. They say, will you pray on behalf of us to the Lord that the Lord would take away these serpents from us? Verse 8 says, then the Lord said to Moses, this is the remedy, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. Hmm. The people realize that they messed up. The people realize that they're wrong. They change their hearts. They change their minds. They turn towards Moses and God again, and they say, we have screwed up big time. How can we make this right? God, can you please take this away? And God says, here's my remedy, Moses. You need to make a brass serpent. You need to put it on a pole. You need to raise it up high in the camp. And anyone who's been bitten by the uh, venomous snakes will look upon the serpent that is on the pole and they'll be healed. They will live. Now, I find it interesting here that God, the remedy, the way in which God chooses to fix this situation is not by taking the snakes away. It's by providing a remedy. He he doesn't take the problem away. He just provides the remedy. And as I was reading that earlier this week, I was thinking, God, why, why do you do that? I go, Israel's problem is that they've been bitten by venomous snakes. So why not take the snakes out of the picture and the problem would be solved? Monday, I read this verse. I was down in my office here and uh, it's about three o'clock. I wake up. I didn't wake. I'm kidding. I wasn't sleeping. I mean, I get up. Sorry. I just kind of slipped out. I was not sleeping. I get upstairs. I get upstairs and um, the bakery's open again. So I go, I, I haven't had lunch. I'm going to have a late lunch and early dinner, go get myself a muffaletta. Anyway, I walk over there. And as I'm waiting for my muffaletta to be warmed up, I'm, I'm looking out the window on Main Street, thinking through this. And I go, God, why do you not take this serpents away? And all of a sudden it hits me. It goes, because the snakes aren't really the children's of Israel's problem. I mean, right now in this moment it is, but the big picture, the snakes are not their problem. Their problem is their heart. So God is trying to teach them to trust him. So if he would just take the snakes away, that wouldn't fix the problem. They would be back into the same distrust. Instead, he makes a remedy in which they're going to have to look upon it in faith and trust him, and that's going to ultimately fix the bigger issue. And after I thought of that, I thought, Lord, I'm starting to think that maybe I need to pray a little differently about the snakes in my life because so often I pray, Lord, take these things away, take this issue, take this trial, take this stuff out of my life, instead of praying, Lord, what's the real remedy for this? God, what what are you actually trying to teach? How how are you trying to teach me to trust you in this? Instead of just wanting you to get it out of here, Lord, what is it you're trying to teach me through this in order to get me to trust you more? So they they pray, he makes this, uh, or he gives Moses the instruction to make this serpent on a pole. The last line of verse number eight, it's gonna come up in verse number nine too, but it's so important. It says, when he looks at it, he shall live. Verse 9 says, so Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was, if a, surf, if a serpent had bitten anyone, he, and he looked at the bronze serpent, he would live. Hmm. So Moses made a bronze serpent. I wonder how long this took. Like, it's, I, it had to take some time, right? And here's the children of Israel. They're slowly dying from poison. And Moses is doing his best to make this, but it does take some time. And they're <coughs> uncomfortable, obviously, waiting for this to be done. But finally, Moses gets it made. Now, this broad serpent is going to come up later on in Israel's history. 
It was a great tool that God used to heal his people to get them to trust him back in Numbers chapter 21. But as you continue reading through the Old Testament, you get to the book of 2 Kings chapter 18 verse 4, and you realize that during the time that Hezekiah is king, the people, God's people Israel, started worshiping this brass serpent <coughs> that Moses had made. Why? Because it was a big deal in their ancestors' lives. And they associated the working of God with this physical thing, but they got confused and they forgot that the ultimate power and authority that healed their great-great-grandma wasn't the serpent, it was the Lord himself. And because of that, uh, Hezekiah in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 4, it says, He removed the high places and broke the, sca- the sacred pillars and cut down the wooden images and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan. He takes this thing, Nehushtan, it means like, it, means, it literally means like, like a serpent. So he takes this thing that the children of Israel had made an idol, and he takes it, he breaks it up, he burns it down, and he covers it up. Now, it really is fascinating to me when we look at Christians and we realize the strange things that we really like to put emphasis on or the strange things that we like to associate the working of God with. Uh, anytime there's going to be change in the life of especially Americans, they're going to freak out, right? Because we like to worship stuff. We, we associate God with, with the setting. When, when we move buildings, people, there are people that freak out about that. They're like, well, well, I got saved in that building, or I've listened to so many great Bible studies in that building. This, look, it's a building. It's Nehushtan. It's like a snake. It's nothing, right? It, it can be, it's going to be broke down one day. And we, get, can so, we can get so attached to physical things, forgetting that it's the Lord behind it that's just using these tools to ultimately accomplish his purpose. So children of Israel, God uses this to save them. Later on, it's going to become an idol. Hezekiah is going to take care of it. Not a big deal. But as I read verse number nine of Numbers chapter 21, I had to ask myself an interesting question. It says, so Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. Let's think back a little ways, like back to Exodus chapter 38, verse number Eight. Where would Moses get the bronze from? Okay. The children of Israel have been in slavery before this 40 years, for 400 years. They leave Egypt. God allows them to leave with some stuff. They have some gold and some silver and some precious stuff and some jewelry. And they leave. They go out into the wilderness. God says, I want you to build the tabernacle in Exodus. He says, I, part of the furnishings of the tabernacle is going to be a bronze laver. And in order to build the bronze laver in Exodus chapter 38 verse 8, it tells us where they get the bronze from. There's no bronze in sight, but there is something that a specific group of people have that's made out of bronze. Exodus 38, 8 says, He made the laver of bronze and its base of bronze from the bronze mirrors of the serving women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. The, way, the place where they got the bronze from to build the laver was from the mirrors of the women who were serving. No doubt, the place where he gets the bronze to make the serpent from is from the mirrors of of the ladies. Now, why is that so significant? Because God says to his people, in order for you to live, you have to look at the serpent on the pole. And if this truly is made out of a bronze mirror type structure, when the people would look at the serpent, who would they see staring back at them? Themselves. They would all of a sudden become aware of the fallen state that they are in. They're forced to look at themselves As in a mirror, in the book of James, it talks about how the word of God is like a mirror to us. We use it to see God's standard, and as we have our face in this, we realize that we don't meet his standard. In um, Galatians, Paul describes the law as being a schoolmaster, a tutor that leads us to Christ. And I believe it's so significant that we understand where this bronze possibly came from because as they're staring at the serpent to live, they're going to be seeing themselves looking back at them, fully aware of the pathetic, sinful state that they are in. Now, 
Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9, it's the backdrop, it's the foundation of the most famous verse in the entire Bible. Turn with me to John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, we see Jesus. <coughs> Ugh, try to mute that, Hagen. We see Jesus, and as Jesus is going on with his earthly ministry, he's at about 30 years old at this point. He's been baptized. He's performed his first miracle, which is turning water into wine at the wedding of Canaan. He has been doing other miracles, and all of a sudden we come onto the scene in John chapter 3, and it's, it's nighttime. It's dark outside. And as it's nighttime, Jesus is approached by a spiritual guy, by a religious dude, and his name is Nicodemus. And John chapter 3 verse 1 says this, there was a man of the Pharisees, and this is a big shot, guys. This is a guy who dressed good. This is a guy who knew the Torah inside and out. This is a guy who devoted his life to understanding the kingdom of God as was revealed in the Old Testament. These were the religious people of the day. Here we see that this Pharisee, whose name is Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, comes to Jesus. Verse 2, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Why would Nicodemus come to Jesus by night? Could be a few things. One, it was cooler then, and he's in the desert, and that would be a time when people would often associate with each other. That could be part of it, but I think there's a deeper reason. Two, because he is a Pharisee, and if people would see Nicodemus... Now, he's not just a Pharisee. He's a ruler of the Jews. He's the ruler of the Jews, as actually says. He's a, he's a big shot leader guy. If they would see him conversing with this rogue rabbi from Nazareth, they, it, it would create a lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, um, um, uh, tension, a lot of drama, a lot of rumors going on there around the time. So they go, he goes, I'm, I'm probably going to sneak away and talk to this rabbi at night. So he approaches Jesus at night, and it says there in verse number three, Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus comes to Jesus in chapter three, verse two, with a compliment. That's a good way to start a conversation. Jesus, we know that you're from God. You're doing great miracles. Jesus cuts straight to the issue. And Nicodemus probably doesn't even know that this is the issue, but Jesus just goes straight to it. He goes, Nick, unless someone is born again, he cannot enter, he cannot see the kingdom of God. As a spiritual guy, as a religious leader, this would obviously strike Nicodemus' attention. Why? Because he's devoted his whole life to the kingdom of God, and Jesus is telling them, unless you do this one thing, you ain't going to see it. So Nicodemus is all of a sudden interested in what this rabbi, Jesus, has to say. Verse 4. Nicodemus says to Jesus, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Interesting question. Um, Jesus, I have to be born again. I'm kind of an old guy here. How can I be born twice? Jesus responds in verse number five. Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water, birth number one, and born of the spirit, Birth number two, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Two births are involved in this process. Born of the water, born of the spirit. What does it mean to be born of the water and born of the spirit? Verse six tells us. That which is born of the flesh, born of the water, born of the flesh, spirit or physical birth. We've all accomplished that. Nothing we done, right? All, our moms did all that work, right? We've all been born of the water. When you're born, there's a lot of liquid involved. Here's a, some anatomy for you, right? There's a lot of liquid involved in the birthing process. So when he says you need to be born of water, he's talking about born of the flesh. You need to be born spiritually, but you also need to be born of the, or physically, you also need to be born of the spirit, he says. Okay, this is the one that we need to find a little bit more about. Verse 7. Jesus says to Nicodemus, obviously, he's kind of perplexed. Jesus says, do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, 
are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? He's kind of doing a little dig here, I think. He's trying to humble Nicodemus. Look, this is the most crucial spiritual truth for someone to understand, and you're claiming to be a religious authority, and you don't understand this. Verse 11, most assuredly I say to you, Jesus speaking, we speak what we know, and we testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our testimony. Could be talking about John the Baptist. Could be some other options. That's a whole other study. Verse 12, if I have told you (coughs) earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Nicodemus, if you can't wrap your mind around earthly stuff, how are you going to wrap your mind around the heavenly stuff? Verse 13, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Jesus referring to himself. Verse 14, this is our key verse. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light. Why, Jesus? He says, because their deeds were evil. Darkness conceals, light reveals. Men choose darkness over light because they want to reveal their sin instead of, because they want to conceal their sin instead of allowing it to be revealed. Verse 20, for everyone who practices evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Jesus trying to explain the born again process to Nicodemus who's a Pharisee, who understands the Torah, who's familiar with Numbers chapter 21 and the fiery serpent and the brass on the pole, says to him, here's how it's going to work. Just like the children of Israel needed to look in faith at the serpent lifted up on the pole, that's how someone is going to be born again spiritually. They're going to look at me, Jesus would say, lifted up. Not, Not on a pole, but on a cross. Now, we need to realize a few things here correlating um, John chapter 3 and Numbers chapter 21, because in Numbers chapter 21, we see the gospel clearly laid out here, and we see that it's oh so simple. We see, as it says at the end of verse number 8, when he looks at it, he shall live. When someone who had been bitten with the serpent looked at the bronze serpent at the pole, That guy now received life. Every single one of us, every humankind, every human being on the planet has been bitten by the serpent of sin. And because of that, we have an issue. But Jesus says, I'm going to be lifted up. Just like the serpent in the wilderness was lifted up, I'm going to be lifted up. And just like all they had to do, was look in faith. All they had to do was trust the Lord and they would live. Now, I am confident that there are people in our story in Numbers chapter 21. And Moses said, here's the deal, guys. You've been bitten. Here's the bronze serpent. Here it is on the pole. Here's what God's told us we have to do to live. Look in faith and live. I'm sure there were people that held their eyes shut and said, that's too simple. We're not going to do it. And guess what happened to those people? They died. I'm sure there were people that said, well, I need to jump through some religious hoops in order to do that. Guess what happened to them? They died. I'm sure there were people that say, well, let me clean up my snake bites before I come before this holy bronze serpent so that I can be worthy. Guess what happened to them? They died. Look in faith and you will live. Jesus says this is how salvation works. This is how one can become 
born again. When I was lifted up on the cross some 2,000 years ago, our Lord would say, whosoever would look upon me in faith, realizing that they've been bitten by the serpent of sin, understanding that I'm taking their place, that person will live. That person is not con condemned. They have everlasting life. Wait a minute. How is a bronze serpent, though, a picture of Jesus? Because the serpent here is picturing sin. Uh, we know that bronze or brass in the Bible is a medal of judgment. So the fact that it's a bronze serpent held up, it's a picture of sin that has been judged. When Jesus was on the cross, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 tells us that he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ be absorbed <laughs> our sin on the cross, and that's why he can be likened to the bronze serpent, the sin that's judged back in Numbers. He was our sin that was judged on the cross, and all we need to do is look to the Lord and live. It reminds me of what Isaiah chapter 45 verse 22 says. The Lord says this, look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Look to me and be saved. In Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2, the writer of the book of Hebrews says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And he goes on, we're looking unto our Lord. We're looking unto Jesus. We're looking unto him, raised up on the cross, understanding that it's him. If the people back in Numbers chapter 21 tried to look at themselves to fix the problem, they would die. If the people back in Numbers 21 tried to get right before they came before the Lord, they would have died. If the people back in Numbers chapter 21 tried to go through 12 steps before they approached the serpent, sin being dealt with, they would have died. It's simply just looking unto the Lord. That is where it's found. And I thank God that it truly is that simple. Romans chapter 10 verse 13 says... Um, well, let me turn there so that I don't mess it up, actually, because it's important and it's short. Romans 10, verse 13 says this, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is pretty much dummy proof, guys. God says, I I'm going to make it so easy for you guys to get saved. And yet, sp humanity, religion comes along and says, let me have you this hoop to jump through and that hoop to jump through and this thing to do and that thing to do and God goes no 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 it's about looking at me it's about having your eyes fixed upon me Jesus says that is what's going to give you salvation that is what's going to get the serpents of sin away from you and that is what the gospel is all about very good um backdrop to understand when it comes to John chapter 3 verse 16. Now the story goes on in Numbers chapter 21 after this takes place. It says in verse number 10, now the children of Israel moved on and they camped in Oboth and they journeyed from Oboth <laughs> and they camped in Ig uh, Abaram in the wilderness which is east of Moab towards the sunrise. From there they moved and they camped in the valley of Zurid. From there they moved and they camped on the other side of Ar Arnon, which is in the wilderness, that extended from the border of, of, the, of the Amorites for uh, the Arnon in the borders of Moab, between Moab and the, Am and the Amorites. Therefore, it is said, verse 14, interesting, therefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord. What is this book? We don't know. No one's found it. No one knows what it is. Here's what I do know. It's not scripture. Do you know how it's not scripture? Because it's not in here. So some people say, well, this is a locked book of the Bible. That No, 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 no. This is just some book that they recorded wars about in, and we don't have it today because we don't need it today. But this is what that book says in uh, <laughs> the end of verse 14 and 15. It says, uh, Wahab and Sufa, the brooks of Arnon, and the slopes of the brooks that reach to the dwellings of Ar and lies on the borders of Moab. From there, they went to Beer, which is in the well, 
which is the well where the Lord said to Moses, gather the people together and I will give them water. From there, they journey on to a place known as Beer. And what do they drink in beer? They drink water. That's encouraging to me. (laughs) Just kidding, kind of. Here they go to this place called Beer, and that just means well. It's a place where a well came up, and God provided for the people water there. Now let's just think about the narrative in chapter 21 and understand how it relates to our Christian walk. They've been redeemed. They've been saved with the serpent. Now they go to a place with a well of water being poured out on them. First, you get saved, you get born again, and as soon as you're saved, you're born again, God pours out water, the Holy Spirit, on you to equip you to now walk this Christian walk that he's called you to. Verse 17, it gets even better. And it says, then Israel sang this song. Spring up, O well, all of you sing to it. The well the leaders sank, (coughs) dug by the nation's nobles, by the lawgivers with their staves. Then... Israel sang the song. It's only the second time that we see Israel singing so far. First time, back in Exodus, right after they get, make it through the Red Sea, they rejoice to God. It's, maybe they sang more, but it sure as heck wasn't recorded. But here we see all of a sudden, their hearts and their minds change towards the Lord. They start to praise him again. And with that, we're going to see that victory continues to follow them with their praising of the Lord. We need to realize something in our own lives. There's going to be times, there's going to be situations, there's going to be moments in your life when you don't feel like worshiping God. Can I give you some advice? Do it anyway. Why? Because the vic- victory is, a, is directly associated with praise. I don't know how it all works, honestly, but I know when you read God's word, that's how it works, and I know that's how it works in my life as well. Victory is directly associated with praising God, and they take the time to sing to him, and because of that, we're going to see that great victory is going to happen. Now, it's very easy for us to get discouraged, to think, well, I don't really feel like worshiping, but every single time with me, when I'm in an attitude, when I'm in a mood, when I don't feel like worshiping, if I turn worship music on anyway, guess what? My attitude changes. All of a sudden, it's like, wow, I'm so glad that I made myself do that. And it's important that we take that, that song, I Raise a Hallelujah. It's all about essentially this concept that as you raise your praises up, heaven comes to fight for you. And that's what we're seeing demonstrated for us here tonight. Um, it says at the end of verse number 18, and from the wilderness, they went to Matana, and from Matana to uh, Nahaliel, from Nahaliel to Bamoth, and from Bamoth in the valley that is, uh, <laughs> that is in the country of Moab, to the top of Pishgas, which looks down on the uh, wasteland. Verse 21, Then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, saying, Let me pass through your land. We will not turn aside into fields or vineyards. We will not drink water from wells. We will go Uh, We will go by the king's highway until we have passed through your territory. The same speech they gave to the um, Edomites, they now give to these guys. Please let us pass through your land. We're not going to touch anything. We're not going to drink your water. We just want to pass through. We'll stay on the king's highway. Remember last week I showed you pictures of that in Jordan. It still exists today. The king's highway does. Verse 23, but Sihon would not allow Israel to pass through his territory. So Sihon gathered all his people together and went out against Israel in the wilderness. And he came to Jahaz and fought against Israel. A battle takes place. You're not coming into our land. We want to go. No way. They start to fight. Verse 24, very important verse. Then Israel defeated him with the edge of the sword and took possession of his land from uh, Aran, Air non to uh, <laughs> Jabok, as far as the people of Ammon, Ammon, for the border of the people of Ammon was fortified. How did Israel win the battle? Verse 24, then Israel defeated them with the edge of the sword. Verses 4 through 9, you're born again. You've looked upon Jesus. Verse um, Seven, verse 16, you're filled with God's spirit. Now you're walking the Christian walk. How do you have victory in your Christian life? Verse 24, edge of the sword, word of God. You use his word to get victory. Verse 25, so Israel took all these cities, and Israel dwelt in all the cities of, uh, Am- of the Amorites in Heshbon and in all their villages. 
For Heshbon was the city of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who had fought against the former king of Moab and had taken all his land from his hand as far as Arnon. Therefore, those who speak in Proverbs say, they're quoting a, a, a ancient proverb of that time, come to Heshbon, let it be built. Let the city of Sihon be repaired. For fire went out from Heshbon, a flame from the city of Sihon. It consumed Ar and Moab. The lords of the heights of Arnon, verse 29, Woe to you, Moab! You have perished, O people of Shemosh. He uh, has given his sons as fugitives and his daughters into captivity captivity to Sihon, king of the Amorites. But we have shot at them. Heshbon has perished as far as Dib Dibon. Then uh, we laid waste as far as Nopha, which reaches to Mediba. Notice there in verse 29, the first part, as they're quoting and singing this proverb, they say, woe to you, Moab. They've dealt with the Canaanites. They're working their way through. They're coming right up against the territory of the Moabites of Moab. And they're kind of chanting out this proverb so that the people can hear. Essentially what they're saying is, Moab, you're next. Moab, you're, 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 you're the next obstacle that's in the way of God's will for us. And you're going to come down, verse 31, thus Israel dwelt in the land of the Amorites, then Moses sent to, uh, spies out to Jazer, and they took its village and drove out the Amorites who were there. Verse 33, and they turned and they went up by way of Bashan. So Og, king of Bashan, went out against them, and he and all his people to battle in uh, Edrei. Then the Lord said to Moses, do not fear him, for I have delivered him into your hand, with all his people and his land, and you shall do to him as you did to Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt at Heshbon. Next obstacle, next issue. God, should I be afraid? Nope, don't be afraid. Why? Same way we dealt with the last guy, we're going to deal with this guy. You see, the Lord gives the children of Israel the victory, get this, even before the battle. Hmm. God gives them the victory even before the battle. The next verse tells us so. They defeated him, his sons, and all his people until there was no survivor left, and they took possession of his land. Wow, how encouraging is that as they're walking obediently with the Lord, as they've been doing things the right way, as they've been <laughs> singing praises to God, as they've been using their swords to defeat their enemies. God says, I'm going to defeat this next guy, just like I defeated the last guy. And you can know that you have victory even before you enter into the battlefield, because I am with you, and greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The next company, the next group of people, but they're up against is the Moabites. And chapter 22 is the story of Israel's encounter with the Moabites. And the king of the Moabites is Balak. And Balak sends <laughs> some guys out to this interesting Gentilish rogue prophet known as Balaam. And next week, we're going to learn all about a talking donkey. So be sure to come out next week and read ahead, because this is another one of the fun Old Testament stories that's referenced in the New Testament. These, these uh, next sub subsequential chapters are actually very important to understanding references that New Testament authors make. So read ahead, understand this. But Numbers chapter 21, so important to understanding um, the gospel in it, all you do is look upon the serpent as you live. All you do is look upon the Lord, and you will receive life. You will live. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you, Lord, for this evening that you blessed us with. God, thank you for uh, your word. Lord, Numbers chapter 21 is such a great uh, section of verses, God, that, that deals with... Um, Lord, such a relatable section for us. Lord, I thank you that those of us in this room... Um, Lord, we have looked to you. Lord, we have trusted you. We believed in faith that you uh, died for us. And because of that, Lord, the serpents of sin no longer bite us. Lord, we are going to live. We have what the Bible calls eternal life. And Lord, that life started at the moment that we believed in you. 
And God, thank you for that truth that we have. Lord, now that we have that, we understand the next step. Lord, you lead us to the water. God, you lead us to the spring. Lord, where your spirit is poured out on us. God, where we are filled with your spirit. Lord, being born again, but Lord, being equipped to now live the life that you've called us to. Lord, as we continue on this journey, (laughs) getting closer to the promised land, God, heaven, there's going to be battles in our life, just like the children of Israel. And the way that those battles are won, Lord, are through praise, through prayer, and through the sword, God, through your word. And I pray that we would use those three things in our lives, God, knowing that we belong to you, that we've looked, that we have life, that we are living, knowing that your spirit is in us. God, now using those tools that you've given us to be victorious in this Christian walk, Lord, so that um, we can uh, make an impact, Lord, in the areas that you have us in, Lord, right now in our lives. Lord, I thank you for... um, God, I thank you for your spirit that you pour out on us. And God, I just pray that tonight that you would fill us afresh, God, um, with your spirit, God, to be able to go forth and to proclaim uh, your truth. God, to be able to have assurance, Lord, of the finished work that you've done on behalf of us. And Lord, just be able to, to do everyday things. Lord, as we read earlier in John 15, 5, Jesus, without you, we can do nothing. So God, I pray that we would just learn to rely upon you, to trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.